Welcome to ICANX 81. Um, Paul Weiss coming to you from UCLA. Uh, and I'm delighted today to be hosting my uh, colleague, a friend, and uh, co editor at ACS Nano, uh, Professor Sharon Glotzer. I'll introduce our panel uh, a little bit later. You know, I think all of us already from uh, the, both the organization of, of ICANX and from uh, Professor Nicholas Pappas uh, speaking uh, here and of course all around the world. Uh, but first let me introduce uh, Dr. Glotzer. Uh, she's the Anthony C. Lemke Department Chair of Chemical Engineering, the John Werner Kahn Distinguished University Professor of Engineering and the Stuart W. Churchill Collegiate Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Michigan where she's also a professor of material science and engineering, physics, macromolecular science and engineering, and applied physics. She's one of our editors at ACS Nano. Her research focuses on soft matter and computation, including assemblies and nanoscience. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We're also proud that she's an alumna of UCLA. And so I will uh, go ahead and uh, turn over the floor to Professor Sharon Glotzer. We've been looking forward to your talk for some time, and uh, we're delighted to have you speak to us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. All right, let me get my, my uh, can you see my slides okay? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. Uh, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Where is that you may be in the world? Um, I am, uh, it's a real pleasure for, for me um, and a real honor to be giving um, this talk today. Uh, and I wanna thank, thank Alice, uh, the organizers and my three illustrious, uh, and four illustrious panelists um, for, uh, for hosting this this morning. Um, so I wanna talk about assembly engineering um, of, of uh, patchy particles in a complex structure. So I'm gonna start out by talking a little bit about what do I mean by assembly engineering and what are patchy particles and why is this useful for thinking about assembly engineering of nanoparticles. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how complex can these, can, can one, um, what kind of complexity can one achieve with self-assembly? Of, of nanoparticles. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about enthalpic versus entropic patchiness. Um, entropic patchiness may be a new concept for, for, for most people, um, as will be the notion of the entropic bond and what that means for the inverse design of, of nanoparticle, patchy particle building blocks for self-assembly of complex structures. So uh, let's start from the beginning and, and define what do we mean by assembly? And when we say self-assembly, when we say assembly, we're typically talking about um, self-assembly in, in nanoscience and soft matter, which is simply a process in nature by which objects organize under their own forces, obeying, of course, the laws of thermodynamics and, and statistical mechanics. So you start with a bunch of building blocks and through simply interacting uh, via the, the, the forces either on the system or between the particles organized into some kind of a, a, a structure. And of course, self-assembly is ubiquitous. It's a ubiquitous process throughout nature, throughout biology. Proteins self-assemble into complex structures, including um, virus capsids, um, you know, lipids and other kinds of molecules will self-assemble into some you know, very exquisite structures, the membrane of a cell is a self-assembled structure. So there's many, many types of self-assembly structures uh, and self-assembly processes in um, biological and soft matter systems. Crystallization is, is also one type of a self-assembly of, of self process where um, atoms and molecules, for example, can organize into ordered crystal structures. Um, for example, gemstones, uh, quartz, silica, um, even you know, just simple table salt is um, uh, has the atoms organized into some kind of regular periodic array. Um, and here I'm just showing you know among the very simplest ordered arrangements of of atoms. And of course, the structure 
that crystals comprised of atoms or molecules take depends upon what the elements are. And, and, and that's because atoms have valence. And by mixing and matching the various elements of the, of the periodic table and creating different kinds of, of local valence among the elements, it's possible to get all kinds of um, very interesting crystal structures. Um, and that's because of chemical bonding. And you know, we know that chemical bonding results from the exchange or the sharing of electrons between atoms. Um, chemical bonding can be explained by quantum theory and by the wave-like nature um, of the electron. And because of chemical bonding um, among elements, atomic elements, atomic structures can achieve some uh, uh, structures of, of uh, pretty great complexity in terms of the size of what we call the unit cell, meaning the size of the repeat unit um, in the crystal. Um, and here's just a few examples of crystal structures with you know, 30, 20, 50, 54, 52 uh, atoms in the unit cell. In some intermetallics, for example, mixtures of, of, of multiple types of metal, uh, metal elements, um, one can get thousands of atoms in a, a unit cell, which is a spectacular level of complexity if we try to think about how those structures form, how the atoms figure out where to go and, and how to arrange themselves in a structure where the repeat unit is, is hundreds or thousands of, of, of particles across. And understanding where this complexity comes from is still a, a big open question. Understanding the pathways, the kinetic pathways by which such, such structures self-assemble is also a, a, an open question. Now, Nanoparticles, particles that are anywhere from a nanometer in size up to a few microns in size, um, can also self-assemble into ordered structures, um, much like atoms can. And there's a number of different um, ways in which uh, one can get nanoparticles to self-assemble. In this example, um, particles are coated with DNA bonds that pull the particles together into organized structures that the particles might uh, not ordinarily want to self-assemble into um, on, on their own. So here's an example I like to use from my colleague, uh, Chad Birkin's lab, where he, uh, the, so the, the image on the right, the big image on the right says colloidal crystals of, of, of gold particles. Um, the, those, are, those are very large faceted crystals that have grown from the self-assembly of, of spherical gold nanoparticles coated with DNA. And if you look in the picture, the, the very smallest feature that you can see really is one of these gold, gold nanoparticles. And they can make these from gold nanoparticles that are tens of nanometers across to a couple hundred nanometers across. And if you, if you look into, if you blow it up and look at how the gold nanoparticles are arranged, um, you'll see in, in this example that they're arranged into a face-centered cubic crystal structure, which is a very simple and very ubiquitous um, crystal structure for um, atomic systems. Um, if, you, if you look uh, at the gold nanoparticles, what of course you can't see here are the DNA um, bonds that are linking gold nanoparticles together. One can do that with, with complementary DNA sequences on different kinds of particles that come and hybridize and pull the particles together, or you can have self complementary strands of DNA that come together and, and, and uh, bind along that, that self complementary sequence and pull the particles together. If you take that gold nanoparticle, say it's like a couple hundred nanometers and you look inside, you'll see the gold atoms are arranged in the same FCC cubic crystal. So there's this beautiful hierarchy of scales that one can find in these um, programmable self-assembled um, uh, structures of, of nanoparticles. It is really, to me, a profound idea that I think we, we often take for granted that these large objects, as large as, as, as a, a couple of microns in size, can self-organize uh, into structures that look just like the structures made by uh, their atomic counterparts. 
And the reason that they can do this is very simple, is that as long as a system is ergodic, meaning that in principle, it, ha it has access to all of the various thermodynamic microstates of the system, any objects can self-assemble like atoms. As long as your system obeys the laws of statistical thermodynamics, and that requires you to be not just on certain length scales, but to have the kinds of fluctuations and forces that actually allow systems to explore and figure out what is the lowest free energy state for the whole system. As long as the system obeys statistical thermodynamics, statistical thermodynamics doesn't care about the origin of the forces. And we're gonna come back to this a little bit. Um, and um, I just, to me, this is a very profound um, idea um, because it means that we can, we can think about taking these systems that are in this middle part here from one to a thousand nanometers, um, which is the scale of which you have proteins and DNA and virus capsids and dendrimers and gold particles and quantum dots and, and all kinds of, of particles that we'll talk about in a second that can be decorated in all sorts of different ways and think about how to engineer them for self-assembly of of structures that are of interest for some particular reason because they have some properties that we're interested in or some kind of behavior that we're interested in. Um, and so when, when I first got into this field um, in the early 2000s uh, and started reading the literature on, on nanoscience and, and looking at well, what, what's a, what is a good problem for a computational group in nanoscience, where the opportunities are endless and where experiments need guidance because it's just too large of a space, too large of a design space to explore with experiment. Um, I started looking at nanoparticle self-assembly and, and from my, my background, I have sort of one, one uh, foot in kind of the, the material science nano world and another foot in soft condensed matter physics, where at that time, um, it was sort of micron sized particles, um, typically made of, of, of uh, polymethyl methacrylate or, or polystyrene or even silica beads um, that physicists were looking at colloidal particles um, and trying to, to get different shapes or kind of trying to, to decorate them in different ways to get them to self-assemble. At that time, these communities didn't really talk to one another. Um, but looking at it from the lens of a, of a computational scientist and from the lens of statistical thermodynamics, it seemed very clear that uh, you know, one to two nanometer gold particles and two nanometer PMMA particles self-assembling in some solution could be treated with the same kind of theoretical framework and the same kind of organizational design principles. Because at the end of the day, they were just particles with some sort of shape decorated in some, some way with um, you know, e either different atoms or different kinds of uh, organic molecules coated in different ways on the particles to create valence. So patchy particles are just particles with shape or interaction and isotropy. They are building blocks for self-assembly of higher ordered structures. Um, but patchy particles has also become like a paradigm that helps us to unite um, very disparate chemistries, materials, and length scales under this common conceptual uh, framework. Um, if we can simply uh, design particles to have patchy interactions, such that it creates valence that, that determines what the local arrangement of other particles will be around each of the particles, well, then we can really engineer particles for, for self-assembly. And what's exciting is that unlike atoms where the valence is, is, is fixed and, um, and you know, the, the electrons are discrete, um, patchy particle valence can be engineered really big, continuously in, in, in any sort of way. And so on the right, this, this uh, shows examples of what at the time we called um, anisotropy dimensions. I think of them now as alchemical dimensions, which just says, you know, here are different ways that you could imagine changing a particle 
in a way that will affect how it wants to self-organize with other particles around it. So the very top row just says, here's a, a, a perfectly isotropic uh, spherical particle. Um, as you move to the right, perhaps this, this is a PMMA particle that's coated on one half with gold. These kinds of colloidal particles are now made regularly. Um, that's called a Janus particle. Um, and you can change how much of what, what that so-called Janus balance is, how much of it is yellow, how much of it is blue, um, all the way to just a, a single particle with a particular sticky patch of ligands on it that will stick to another sticky patch of ligands on another nanoparticle. Or you could take any one of these particles and simply change the aspect ratio. And when you do that, of course, that will change how the particles wanna align next to one another. Um, many, many nanoparticles are grown in solution. And because they're grown in solution, they grow as little crystallites. Um, and that means that they grow in a faceted way. And so it's possible to get all kinds of faceted particles nowadays. Um, uh, back when we started doing this, it was, you know, you would see on the cover of Nature and Science every, every week, a new particle shape. It didn't matter if you could make them perfect or monodisperse, um, or if you could really do anything with them, but every you know every achievement was that uh, uh, sort of every every new way of making a particle of a particular shape or decorating it in a certain way was demonstrating an achievement by the experimental community of being able to start to really engineer at that nanometer scale. So here's just a few examples. Um, on here, this is, this is, I know this is a very busy slide. Um, there's four kind of columns here. Um, on the left, this is, I'm showing some work from um, Shun Chen at the University of Illinois and Steve Granick. This is work when he was at Illinois um, uh, and now he, he is in Korea, um, showing these uh, tri-block Janus particles that they synthesized. Um, where there's three different blocks. You could think of it as the particle analog of a tri-block copolymer, where the, say the dark parts of the particle want to uh, attract to other dark parts and the light parts want to attract to, to light parts. And so they self-organize into these really interesting patterns. Here they were able to achieve um, on the left something called a, a Kagome lattice. Um, below that, that is, uh, is the Ole Gang's group where they're, they make, they use DNA to make little nano cages that they can trap particles of arbitrary shape into and then use this um, DNA skeleton framework around the particles to bring particles together into some organized arrangement. Um, of course, DNA nanotechnology and, and DNA programmable assembly now has um, you know, become a, a small industry um, with leaders like Ole Gang and of course, Chad Merkin uh, uh, and, and Paul Sadas, who pioneered this technology back in the late 90s, um, where they were trying to organize gold particles with DNA. And it started with just junk aggregates, well, I wouldn't call it junk, aggregates that over time became these beautiful ordered arrays that, um, that they could design uh, DNA sequences exactly to get the different ordered uh, arrays that they want. And then, of course, if you look at uh, Chris Murray and Dimitri Talapin's work and their, uh, their colleagues, um, they mix and match different kinds of particles, typically rare earth particles, platelets of different shape, and I'll show some of those in a little bit, um, self-organized into all kinds of, of, uh, of beautiful, beautiful patterns. And I'm going to show some of the stuff on the right um, in just a few minutes. So there's just, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what so many different groups are now able to make by designing and making nanoparticles and colloidal particles with various types of patchiness um, to get them to self-assemble into ordered structures. Okay, trying to advance. There it is. So I, I, in my talk, tell I use these words assembly engineering. Which is what I what which is what I call the engineering, meaning the designing and the making of the right particles that exert the right forces on one another in order to obtain under the right conditions a target self-assembled structure with some desired properties. So assembly engineering is really self-assembly by design, purposeful self-assembly 
but you can make analogies with chemical reaction engineering where you start with reactants and at the end you have products and the whole point is to uh, optimize the yield, the products that you get for the, for the reactants by um, engineering that whole chemical reaction pathway and, uh, and the ways in which you get the system to, to go along a certain pathway. And I think there's a lot of analogies to be made with self-assembly. I'm putting this on this, on, on these, um, this engineering foundation. So my group makes none of these beautiful structures that I just showed you um, because we're a computational group. And so we um, do theory modeling and simulation and we develop uh, software from our simulation codes that are all open source and that, that, that we share for others to use um, that enable us to, to investigate this whole space that, that I'm, I've been talking about. And so we have a number of different um, codes. Our main um, software package that we use is called Humdi Blue. It's a very powerful, highly parallelized GPU enabled code to do molecular dynamics uh, and Monte Carlo dynamics and where there's lots of software, lots of, lots of scientific software that will let you do MD and, and Monte Carlo. Um, HoomD Blue was designed from the beginning to focus on nanoparticles and patchy particles. And so it's highly optimized for, for that. Um, and we have other codes like Freud, which we use for analysis codes, Syniac, which is a, 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 a um, data management software framework that allows us to very easily keep track of when we go, in, go and study um, a particular design space where we might study tens of thousands of different combinations of design parameters, it helps us organize all of that and be able to reuse and share it later. Um, and so if you look at the bottom left, you'll see a, a, a URL um, where uh, you, you can find all of our codes if anyone um, is, is interested. And so everything, I'm gonna, all the results I'm gonna show you are simulations that were generated with this uh, software ecosystem. And so when I say molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo simulations of nanoparticles, our typical product is something like this on the left, which is showing the self-assembly of tetrahedrally shaped nanoparticles into some organized structure. And you, you'll see, and I'll just run this really quickly again, um, that uh, there's, they start out as little just green dots and then you see the particle. Well, when they're little green dots, then they're locally not in any kind of organized arrangement. And so which, what we end up with in this Monte Carlo simulation is uh, a crystal coexisting with a fluid of the same particles. We're just not showing the particles in the fluid because then it's really hard to see the crystal. And whether we're doing Monte Carlo simulations or molecular dynamics simulations with an anisotropic shape potential, um, we're basically doing it to, minim to mimic Brownian motion of nanoparticles in the fluid. We're assuming that, our, that the particles are, are suspended in some, or not suspended, but in a fluid, um, and they're being bombarded by the molecules that make up that fluid. And in that way, they're undergoing the like, standard um, Brownian motion. And when we do our simulations, um, we use what are called periodic boundary conditions with a, which allow us to mimic an infinite system when we do simulations say at constant volume. You can also do simulations at constant pressure where also you have these periodic boundary conditions. Um, and as long as your, your system size is significantly larger than the unit cell of the crystal that you're making, then having these finite, having these periodic boundary conditions is, is, um, is not a problem, especially when you have a coexisting system like this. Um, and what's really important in these simulations that you don't see here is as we run this, these simulations, of course, we allow the box that the particles are in to change shape at however it wants to. If the volume's fixed, you might fix the volume, but you let the edge lengths change. So the whole thing is able to pick out whatever crystal symmetries it may want um, to be. So some examples of what we're able to, to do um, most recently in design of, of patchy particles. Um, this is a, this is work, oops. This is work um, with Chris Murray's group. 
um, in a, a grant that we that we share together, where they they are, they make these rare earth nanoplates that are um, uh, like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a parallelogram, like a um, a sheared little square. Um, and they can functionalize them with different kinds of organic ligands. And on the left, they were taking these nanoplates and they were functionalizing them with oleic acid, just meaning they throw oleic acid in and oleic acids bind graft at one endpoint to this, this endpoint here to the particle and they go wherever it is that they, that they wanna go. And that what they were finding is that they, these, these things would stack up and then they'd stack up and make these columns and then they get these, these, these beautiful columns. Um, and so the, one of the questions they had was, well, why, why is it, why are they doing, you know, why are they stacking up like that? And what if we don't want stacks? What if we wanted to get layers? Um, and so uh, my, um, my postdoc, TiVo, whose work I'm gonna show uh, quite a bit of today, um, was able to just simply write down a, a scaling theory that shows where the ligands most likely want to attach to the nanoparticles as a function of how bulky the ligands are. So way on the left up here at the top, along this, this arrow, um, low ligand density on the left, high ligand density on the right, sorry, low ligand density is blue, High ligand density is red, and you're increasing bulkiness from left to right. So the oleic acids, simple oleic acids, they're not very bulky. And so what we find is that the ligands are free to basically go anywhere. They, they tend to avoid the very center where they're going to be um, pushed up against one another because then they don't have a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, free volume to move around in. But because they're basically uniformly covering it, it's very and, and they're attractive to one another, you get them to stack up. As you start increasing the bulkiness, for example, turning your oleic acids into dendromers of increasing size and, and bulkiness and, and, and even changing the shape with the different levels of dendromer, then um, theory predicts that the dendromers will organize on the surfaces of particles in different ways. And the more bulky they are, the more they wanna go around the edges and, and they basically change the effective shape of these nanoplates. And again, because the ligands are attractive, now instead of stacking like this, they're, they're arranging parallel so that, the, so that the ligands can interact with one another. And so these are simulations that we did in green here showing how you get these layers now. And it's really hard to see in these pictures, it's very subtle but as you increase the bulkiness of the particles, you get an offset like this um, in, the, in, the, in the stacking of the layers. Um, and these are the, uh, the uh, TM images on the, on the right that show these various things. So, um, so this was something that, that we were able to predict um, and tell them what sort of dendromers to use and what kinds of structures they would get with what kinds of offset. Um, and so the, the, the simulations are very well validated by the experiments. A second example of something that, that we worked on with them is um, assembling nanocubes and nanoplates, um, getting co-crystals from particles of, of different shape is, is tricky. Um, if you mix together, say cubes and plates, nanoplates, there's a number of different things that can happen. Uh, that are that are indicated here. On the far left, you could just have that they just stay mixed up randomly. You have cubes, you have you have nanoplates, and they just are randomly in there. Or you could have complete phase segregation and have all the nanoplates assembled together and all of all the cubes self-assembled together. Or you could have different kinds of co-assemblies. Um, this one right in the middle, the one with the green outline, that's a co-assembly of cubes and nanoplates. Um, but with an excess of nanoplates. And to the right of that is a co-assembled structure of cubes and nanoplates with an excess of cubes. Um, and on the far right is like a very nice crystal that you'd like to be able to grow of just a pure co-crystal. And that was their target. Um, and so again, they started with oleic acid, functionalizing their triangular nanoplates and 
cubic nanoparticles with oleic acid. Um, and they, they, were, they had trouble getting this nice co-assembly that they wanted. And so we uh, took Teve's theory and did simulations and calculations and looked at, at a phase diagram that would show us as a function of the, um, basically stoichiometry in the system, the volume fraction of nanoplates uh, relative to the cubes as a function of how interactive, how strongly the, the oleic acids on the surface of these wanna interact with each other, you can get different sorts of, of phases, but the interesting phase is this red striped blue one right here. The problem was it was pretty small co-assembly region. And so they, it was hard for them to just to, to get it, to, to get, aim right at it. And so again, this, the, the theory suggested that if one simply makes the ligands bulkier, then you can really broaden this large co-assembly region and, and have a much easier shot at getting the structure that, that you want. And here are some of their structures on the right where in this middle of this large co-assembly region uh, marked A, that's this top TEM image uh, on the bottom right that shows this, this whole like, very nice you know, uh, co-assembled structure. And these other ones are different different sorts of phases where you have an excess of plates or you have an excess of, of cubes or, or, or other things. Uh, one can even sometimes treat proteins as patchy particles. And so in a, in a, uh, a project that we had with Andy Ellington's group uh, at UT Austin, where Nick is, um, it, they, that group was interested in, and still is interested in supercharging proteins to make them um, electrostatically patchy, if you will. And, but they needed to be able to design where those extra charges would go on, these, on their protein so that they would self-assemble into some kind of interesting objects. Um, and so by uh, you know, starting with a, you know, atomistic resolution of their proteins here, green, green fluorescent proteins. Um, one could, we, we came up with a, a, a model. This is work done by um, Jens uh, Glaser, who was a postdoc in my group, now working at Oak Ridge National Lab on big uh, fancy supercomputers. Um, came up with a patchy particle model of supercharged green fluorescent proteins that helped us to understand the protomers that they were getting, and this is just a rendering of it on the cover of this uh, journal um, uh, that shows the kind of protomers that they were attaining in their, um, in their experiments to understand why they were getting these particular kinds of structures based on how the patchy protein particles wanted to organize relative to one another. This is the, the most complex colloidal crystal structure that's been published in the literature to date that I'm aware of. It's a clathrate colloidal crystal from the Merkin lab made of gold nanoparticles with this um, bipyramidal shape here in gold, um, where it's like if you had a tetrahedron and another tetrahedron and you aligned them and then you squashed it, that is what this particle shape looks like. Again, functionalized with DNA as, as they do, self-complementary DNA. Um, and because of the shape of this particle, they, um, these nanoparticles organize in such a way as to grow this gorgeous structure where here on the, in the micrograph at the top right, the bright spots are gold nanoparticles. And so you see them arranged in this beautiful um, pattern. And it turns out that this is a, a, a clathrate structure. Um, clathrates are, are typically well, clathrate structures are open cage-like structures, hierarchically ordered cage-like structures that you find uh, in, in water, for example, guest host clathrates. This is the same kind of crystal structure as, as one of those, but self-assembled from these gold nanoparticles and designed by simulation by looking at the different, the effects of shape on, on, on self-assembly. Um, and this is just an example of what the unit cell of this of the structure looks like. Now even more complex colloidal crystal structures are coming. And so one of the things I think is really exciting is as far as I can see, there is no end to the complexity of the self-assembled crystal structure that one can get with nanoparticles and different kinds of 
bonding elements. Um, we're on a quest in my group to see, um, you know, are there some atomic crystal structures, <clears throat> excuse me, that just cannot be obtained with nanoparticles? Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and if so, why? What's special about those crystal structures that we can't get them uh, with nanoparticles? The other question that <clears throat> my group spends a lot of time on, on looking at is what is the role of entropy in nanoparticle self-assembly? So uh, let me show you the simulation of nanoparticle assembly. Um, go back, here's the thingy. So <clears throat> I'll run this a couple of times. There's one kind of particle in this system. It's a truncated tetrahedron. It's a, it's a tetrahedron where the edges and the corners have been truncated a little bit. And there's only one kind of particle. At the start of the simulation, we start them off randomly mixed together in a fluid. And then we, we don't show the particle, we just color it blue fuzzy. That's the fuzzy fluid phase. Um, as soon as a particle locally becomes ordered in something that's very different from the liquid, then we colored it orange. And as soon as the particle becomes part of what ends up being the final crystal, which we know because we run the simulation all the end and then go back and color the particles, then we color them red. So this crystal, this, this structure here, this red thing is, is a crystal that is in coexistence with a fluid phase. And if I just run this one more time, um, you see that the system is just starting to figure out what to be. And first you get these local ordered structures that are not part of the crystal yet, but they're clearly ordered like spheres of particles. And then at some point, the whole thing just finds the, finds the crystal and, and now you have the, the beautiful crystal structure. Somehow the crystal is assimilating particles, not particle by particle, but groups of particle by groups of particle. Um, into, uh, into the final structure. What's cool about the structure is that it has 432 particles in the unit cell. It's isostructural to something called the Bergman phase that Linus Pauling found a number well, many, many years ago. Um, so that's the, that's the largest unit cell structure that we have ever found in self-assembly. It hasn't been made yet to my, to my knowledge. But the other thing that's really interesting about this crystal structure is that there's no, there are no ligands, there's no DNA, there's no sticky attractive interactions between these particles whatsoever. These particles are hard particles like billiard balls. They don't interact except for excluded volume that says they can't overlap one another. Um, and yet they self-assemble into this crystal structure. Um, there's no energy in this system. There is only, there is only entropy in this system, meaning that this thermodynamic system is ordering to minimize free energy as all these systems do. Um, but here the free energy is comprised solely of entropy. And so minimizing the free energy is maximizing the entropy. Now, <clears throat> We have in fact known since 1949 that hard particles, hard shapes interacting in no way other than simply excluded volume can order um, due to the work of Ansager um, in this famous paper where he described for the first time what we now know as the isotropic pneumatic transition of, of hard rods that underlies all of liquid crystal physics um, where you, have rods that have a long enough aspect ratio, typically larger than three to one. These are probably five to one. Um, and we color them red when they're locally disordered. And then we see that they start to locally order and we color them green and then that order spreads through the system. Again, this is an entropically induced transition from an isotropic phase to a pneumatic phase where the particles are not positionally ordered but they're, they're on average aligned with one another. And the reason that they do this is because um, entropy is maximized by having more ways of arranging the rods, more microstates available to the system. If, you, the, if the particles are forced to 
point randomly at one another and not organize, then at some point they'll get jammed up. They just can't, they can't order any, they can't do anything anymore. They can't move anymore. But if they line up with one another, all of a sudden they give up those rotational degrees of freedom for translational degrees of freedom. And now they can access many more different kinds of microstates, many more ways of arranging the rods. And it just so happens that there's more ways of arranging the rods that's consistent with this nematic aligned phase than there are with the random phase. And that's, that's how, how this works. Now, a, a, about a decade later, uh, Kirkwood came along and said, a chemist also came along and said, um, I bet hard spheres will also order into a crystal. Um, people thought that was absurd because at least when there's, um, when you have anisotropy in the shape, you could understand, oh, okay, they're gonna line up. But these are spheres, why would they do this? But in fact, and, and here I'm showing you a simulation that was basically identical to the simulation that was done in 1957 by Alder and Wainwright, molecular dynamics simulations that for us took, I don't know, a minute and back then took over a year on a full cray. This is, you know, you could run this on an iPhone now. Um, where the particles, these are spherical particles like billiard balls, they start out disordered and red and now all of a sudden they crystallize and it turns out that they crystallize into a face centered cubic crystal. Now this was argued over for decades, the idea that hard spheres would, would spontaneously self-assemble into a crystal structure. They argued about this for, for decades. Um, and of course it was just a simulation. So people were like, Bleh. who knows what's going on in those simulations. Um, but the definitive experiment was done, and this is the title of a crystallization of hard sphere colloids and microgravity that was done by uh, Bill Russell and Paul Chaikin's groups um, when they were able to fly their PMMA uh, in toluene samples on the space shuttle and show that even in the absence of gravity, you could get these beautiful self-assembled crystal structures, um, despite the fact that their PMMA particles in toluene had been um, uh, density matched so that there's, they eliminate all possible gravity and also um, match the index of refraction of the, of the particles in the solution, which basically uh, screens out any kinds of van der Waals interactions that you might have. So there really are hard particles. And the experiment was carried out by the space shuttle crew. And so they were authors on this paper. So this, that, that paper was published in 1997. Um, and, and so since then, now we, we, we understand this very simply, or that entropy can drive order if order has more options, meaning that there's more disorder because it's ordered, where the disorder means that you're lacking information. It could be in more microstates uh, if it's ordered than not ordered. So, so if you had to pick which one it was in at any given time, you'd have, have uh, more choices and therefore less information about the system. And that way you think of it as disordered, but physically it's, it's, it's ordered. Um, and that simply comes from the fact that systems evolve to the most probable state. That's the fundamental tenet of thermodynamics. Microstates with the same energy are all equally probable. It's like a law of nature. Um, and if you have no interaction energy, as in these examples I just showed you, then the free energy is just minus two times the entropy. And so you minimize free energy by maximizing entropy. And in such a system, the entropy can be written in the simple way that Boltzmann did, where omega is just the number of ways of, of arranging all the, all the particles. So we first started, uh, we, we first realized just how profound the role of entropy could be in self-assembly of nanoparticle shapes um, with this work that we published back in 2009, um, when we were studying simple hard tetrahedra and found them miraculously to self-assemble into a dodecagonal quasi-crystal, which is a crystal that has no repeat unit. Um, it's no, it doesn't have translational periodicity, but it has, uh, it has rotational, uh, long range rotational order. And in, in this case, it has 12 fold rotational order. Um, it was really surprising because it's literally the simplest three-dimensional object that you could have is this platonic solid that 
would self-assemble from a random fluid initial condition to this really highly organized structure whose, if it were a crystal, would have no fewer than 82 particles in the unit cell. And it produces this gorgeous diffraction pattern where you can go around and count you know, 12, 12 peaks showing that it has 12 fold uh, symmetry. And it turns out that that crystal is isostructural to the tantalum tellurium quasi-crystalline chalcogeni that was reported many years be before um, an atomic uh, quasi-crystal. Um, and if we took our diffraction pattern and put it on top of their diffraction pattern, it, it just matches up, up perfectly. So here's an example of, of a, a nanoparticle system that without any interactions, solely due to entropy can self-assemble into a very complex crystal structure that has a, a, a clear atomic analog. Um, and so the, the, to describe these, the, what's going on, the way that, that it, it, I think it's easiest for me to think about is in terms of excluded volume or free volume, which are kind of like opposite things. So um, if, I, if we go through this figure, um, let's say on the, on the top left, uh, you have two particles, two cubes, and imagine that they're not in a box by themselves, but they're actually in a sea of other cubes. Um, and, and you look at the difference between two cubes aligning in some haphazard way versus really lining up face to face, like in the bottom. Well, the one on the top, the orientate local configuration on the top has a lot more excluded volume, meaning that other particles can't get in there. It's wasted space. It's a volume that can't be accessed by any, any other particles. Um, whereas if, they, if the particles line up like this, then there's actually much less excluded volume in the system. When there's less excluded volume, it means that there's more accessible volume in the system for the other particles, and that's called the free volume. So um, when particles go from being randomly organized to lining up with one another, they take up less excluded volume. That gives more free volume to the system more places for other particles to go and to arrange. So more ways of arranging particles, more microstates, more entropy. That's what's going on here. It's Onsager on steroids. Onsager has rods that say that this is, there's, there's a lot of excluded volume if the rods point randomly to one another where other rods can't go. But if they line up, then other rods can come in. And that's what's going on here when you have these polyhedral shapes. Um, and so, so now we know that, that there's all kinds of crystal structures. There's this extraordinary diversity and complexity of crystal structures possible simply from looking at particle shape uh, and, and without even putting in the inter any additional interactions yet between the particles. Um, and so for example, there's you know, these beautiful structures on, on the right from these different kinds of, of, of shapes. Um, all where, where you start out with just a random thing and you just run a Monte Carlo simulation or molecular dynamic simulation, the particles are rotating locally and, and, and just jiggling around by Brownian motion until all of a sudden they realize that there's a, there's a, a lower free energy um, state that they can be in. This, I love this movie. Um, this is a system of pentagonal dipyramids studied by uh, my former student, Sangman Lee, who's now with the Baker Group, uh, University of Washington. This pentagonal dipyramid looks like this on the upper left. This is the side view and then the top view. Um, without any interactions, this particle, a system of these particles, first the blue is a fluid phase. It forms this yellow phase, which is a high density amorphous phase. And then in between high density morphous phase, you get this growing crystal and you can see how it's growing. This assembly pathway is really complex, how this crystal is growing. If I just, if you, you know, had never met me, had never listened to this talk and I just showed you this movie and said, well, what do you think the interactions are between these particles? You'd probably say, well, they're, they must be attractive to one another because they're sticking together and growing this crystal. When in fact, they are not. Uh, remember the clath rate that I showed you earlier that uh, the Merkin lab made and that we were able to simulate with DNA and everything. 
Um, it is also possible to obtain exactly that structure without DNA and just by increasing the density of the particles. And so on the left, what you see is the, the system is full of particles where it's where you just see white space, there's actually fluid particles just randomly organized. But the blue is a dense amorphous solid phase that's growing. And the red is the final crystal that is growing at the interface between the dense amorphous phase and the fluid. And so you start to see this beautiful um, clackrate crystal structure emerging from this um, simulation even though there's no interactions between the particles, it's just solely due to entropy. And the simple reason for that is that if you throw particles into water, say DNA, DNA coated nanoparticles in water, um, the DNA is linking them together. So all they have to do is find one another and then it sticks them together. If you just threw a bunch of hard particles without any attractive interactions into, into water um, and, and gave them lots of room to move around, they're not going to stick together and form anything. I mean, they're, they're never going to stick together, but they're, they, they're not going to form anything. But if you crowd them so that they now start to feel each other, then they can order. The DNA or ligands and the other examples are there to pull the particles together so that the shape can now influence what's going on. Um, in these entropic systems, they simply need to be crowded um, and you can get some of the same types of behavior. Um, what's also exciting about this particular study is that the assembly pathway for this clathrate, both with DNA and without DNA, involves fluid-fluid phase separation. It doesn't just go from a fluid to, to a crystal. It actually uh, forms, I, I think I said before, dense amorphous solid. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say dense amorphous fluid. The particles are still highly mobile in this dense phase. You get a coexistence of a high density fluid phase and a low density fluid phase. And then the crystal comes out of that, which is exactly how molecular clathrates form. So what we learn from, from, this, from this work uh, is that entropic forces can be directional, right? So we've known since 1949 and on Sagar that entropic forces that you have in these hard particle systems can order things. What we understand better now is that the forces uh, can manifest themselves locally as directional, right? So that comes from understanding this excluded volume picture that takes shapes going from some haphazard relative local arrangement to something ordered. You can think of it as the entropic forces are locally directional. And if we look at all the systems that we have studied, we see lots of examples where the systems are like metallic bonding or covalent bonding or even ionic bonding. If the topic forces are, can be locally thought of as directional, that's what I call entropic patchiness, right? So just like you can have a particle, like a jazz particle, with, you know, one side is, wants to organize things a certain way, the other thing, side wants to organize things a different way. Here you are attaining that simply with particle shape. And so it's a type of patchiness that comes from entropy and these statistical emergent forces that arise upon crowding. And if you could imagine that now the shapes are like entropically patchy, meaning for example, two cubes want to align face to face, not vertex to, to face or vertex to edge, right? So there's like sticky parts and non-sticky parts, that's the patchiness. But it also means that there's effectively and tropic bonds in this system. It's as though there are, you know, if you say directional interactions, I say bonds. So you think of entropic tropic bonds. And so if we think about all these different systems, chemical bonding, as you have in these atomic molecular crystals, physical bonding that you have say in these ligand and DNA mediated self-assembly of nanoparticles or entropic bonding that we have here in these um, hard particle systems, um, there's, there's a beautiful analogy across this whole spectrum. And I think that the extent to which the complexity and diversity of structure is possible from chemical bonding and from entropic bonding is, is really kind of surprising. 
Um, but it just demonstrates again that self-assembly is agnostic to the origin of the interactions, the ignored, agnostic to the origin of bonds. As long as the system is subject to the laws of thermodynamics, it doesn't matter whether, the, whether there's electrons or whether there's ligands or DNA or whether there's simply entropy that's organizing things, um, you can get in principle, what we're seeing is the same kinds of structures. So in the last just couple of minutes, I think I have five minutes. So in the last five minutes, um, uh, I'll talk about how uh, we have tried to, to write down the theory of entropic bonding. Um, that's analogous to a theory of chemical bonding. Why would we do that? Well, you know, there's ab initio theories of chemical bonding in atomic crystals that, you know, you can, there's all these software packages out there that are called, you know, electronic structure methods, things like that, density functional theory, where you can um, say, uh, you know, I have iron atoms and I want to see, you know, what's the low, what's the ground state energy, what's the ground state structure for a bunch of iron atoms. Um, and so you arrange your atoms in a particular crystal structure. Um, you run these, this code, it gives you an energy. You can set them up in a different crystal structure, run it again, it gives you another energy. And you do this as long as you want to. And eventually you look at all your structures and all their energies, whichever has the lowest energy is what you say, that's the thermodynamically preferred crystal structure. These codes are all solving an eigenvalue equation. The eigenvalue equation is either Schrodinger's equation directly or much more commonly now, the Cohn-Sham equations, which are an eigenvalue equation um, for the, the spatial distribution of electrons in, in the system. Um, and so our hypothesis was, well, if particle shapes self-assemble into the same crystals and atoms, then we should be able to develop an ab initio theory for entropic bonding that's analogous to ab initio theory of chemical bonding in atomic crystals. Um, and again, this is our starting point. Um, what we need to do though is figure out, you know, in, a, in chemicals, in atomic systems, there's electrons and the electron distribution is what determines the structure and the, the energy of the system. And so you can write down a governing equation in terms of the local density of electrons and how they're, how they're arranged. We don't have those things. We don't have electrons, but we have excluded volume. And we wanna see how the local density of excluded volume is kind of, is, is, is around the system. And if we can locally minimize excluded volume, it'd be like, max, like uh, maximizing the overlap of electronic orbitals. Um, and so we just needed a way to count the local excluded volume in a way that we could write a governing equation. And so, the idea that TiVo came up with is to introduce pseudoparticles, just fictitious mathematical construct as a proxy for the local excluded volume. You throw these, these fake things, fake particles into the system, then they'll go where the excluded volume is and you can, uh, and then we can, count, we can count them. And in that way, we could minimize local excluded volume. Um, it, it basically transforms these implicit local directional and tropic interactions to explicit local interactions we can quantify. Um, and so the, the, the basic idea is that you start with these pseudoparticles, you derive a mean field effective interaction between particles and pseudoparticles. So now the entropic forces that are aligning neighboring particles to one another are going to be recast as um, energetic interactions between pseudoparticles and the particles that hold the particles together. Then you could write down a convection diffusion equation for the pseudoparticle density, and that gives you an eigenvalue equation. Um, and then you simply solve the eigenvalue equation for a given arrangement of particles, and that gives you the lattice formation of ener uh, lattice uh, energy of formation of this proxy system, which gives you the entropy of the original system. So I don't expect anyone to understand anything I just said because this takes a longer time to explain, um, but we have a preprint on the archive that, um, that I'd love for uh, people to look at and send us comments on. Um, you end up with this governing equation for the pseudo particle density where 
essentially this is an eigenvalue, I mean, not essentially, it is an eigenvalue equation. You have an operator on the left um, operating on the local pseudoparticle density and an energy, lattice energy formation on the right, the eigenvalue um, times the, again, the same function, the pseudoparticle density. And then you can just, you can just solve that. Um, the, in, you know, when you solve um, electronic structure methods, when you use those to solve for what's the best structure for a bunch of atoms, uh, you know, what's the ground, what's, what, what do they prefer to be? What's the ground state? Um, you know, the idea is that you put the atoms on the lattice points and now you want to, you want to <clears throat> have the atoms interact, but we can't deal with the, the, you know, we assume the nuclei are much slower, the electrons, we throw out that, we just say, okay, we have a little electron clouds sitting on every lattice point. But the electron clouds, clouds are complicated. And so we say, well, we can't deal with all that. So we're gonna, we're gonna write, a, a, we're gonna expand um, every electron cloud, which has some, some kind of shape in the crystal structure. We're gonna expand that in terms of spherical harmonics. And then we'll have like the first order, the second order, and those are the atomic orbitals. And then typically we say, well, we can't deal with all of those. So we'll just start with the lowest order of orbitals and we'll take higher order orbitals when we need to. Um, and, uh, and then, um, sorry. And so then, so then you expand in these atomic orbitals. So for us, we, we have this confined system of shapes. We're replacing it by a proxy system of pseudoparticles. And, and so now every particle around it can be, we want to look at the local pseudoparticle cloud, but instead of expanding in spherical harmonics to mathematically solve the system, we expand that pseudoparticle cloud in harmonics that are appropriate for the symmetry of the system. Um, and so every shape will be, will be different. And then you get what, are, what we call shape orbitals. They are prefer perfectly analogous to these electron orbitals. Um, and in electronic structure methods, you, the, the way you solve the problem is you have your structure of atoms and you have your uh, electron orbitals, uh, local electronic orbitals, then you, you create a molecular wave function or whatever for the system by, by adding up all the individual ones on all the, the lattice sites. Um, and then you would, each one has a weight associated with it. And the goal is to, is to solve this iteratively until everything converges and you get some, uh, and you get an answer for the molecular wave function of the system or the, the, the steady state distribution of electrons in the, in the system. We can use exactly the same algorithms to solve this. And if you do, then we, you can get what, you know, if you have like two particles in a sea of other particles and you ask, okay, I have this bunch of cubes, they self-assemble into this cubic crystal. Um, you know, it's not at packing fraction one, so there's space in between. Um, what is the effective energy? If there was an energy, right? There's, it's not, there's entropy, but the entropy is making it as though there's an effective, attractive, directional, patchy traction between particles. Now we can calculate what that is in terms of an energy. And that's where we get the idea <clears throat> that this thing looks just like a bond. And you could see this energy as a function of the distance between particles. And you could also do this function of orientation between particles. This is what those, those uh, bonds look like for different shapes. Um, in, in different systems. And so really quickly, oh, I got to stop in a second. Um, <clears throat> just to show you for, for example, how would you use this? So for a cube, you could say, well, let's say I didn't know that hard cubes should self-assemble into a cubic crystal, but I could guess a bunch of different crystals. So I can set up my cubes in a bunch of different crystals and, and, and also for a lot of different orientations of the particles. Um, and then run this iterative solver and calculate the <clears throat> free energy of the system. Whichever one has the lowest energy will win. So here, <clears throat> T did that for uh, cubes arranged in simple cubic crystal, face center cubic, BCC, and you see that the simple cubic has the lowest free energy or the highest entropy. Um, and so that one wins. So this works for that. Um, 
But here's a much more challenging example. This is work that we published back in 2012, where we studied the self-assembly of truncated tetrahedra and found first this quasi-crystal that I showed earlier. If you start to truncate the tips, eventually you get diamond. You start to truncate the tips more, eventually you get the high pressure lithium phase, eventually a body center cubic phase of octahedra. <clears throat> and that's at a say, fixed packing fraction, just as a function of changing the shape. And so <clears throat> I challenged T to put this through his machinery. Um, and this is what the results look like. So <clears throat> the, if you, so these are the different crystal structures. Um, bl light blue is quasi crystal, purple is BCC, pink is diamond. Um, this one's actually beta tin. It was, it was a different phase in between those four that I didn't show you. Um, and then you calculate for each one, you say, what's the energy? What's the energy? What's the energy? And at every value of, of shape of the, so truncation means that's the shape of the particle. And whichever one is lowest wins. So we see that the quasi crystal wins, 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 wins until you get to this truncation value. And now diamond is better. And that goes until you get to this truncation value. And now beta 10 is better. And then eventually uh, uh, BCC is better. And, and then he summarized these results in this color bar down here blue, pink, orange, purple, the black lines are from that 2012 paper that just by doing Monte Carlo simulations for various truncations, we just observed where the transition was and it matches up really nicely with uh, <clears throat> these, these theoretical predictions from entropic bonding theory. So to summarize, <clears throat> one can make this very loose analogy between chemical bonding and entropic bonding um, where the hard shape is like the atomic nucleus, these pseudo particles, which are just mathematically fictitious things, mediate, can be, you can think of it as mediating entropic interactions like electrons do. In chemical bonding, you have a, the nuclear electron interactions. First, we have shape pseudo particle interactions. Um, the orbitals, the atomic orbitals versus now we have shape orbitals. Um, for chemical bonding, we have orbital hybridization here. It's, it's orbital overlap. It's maximizing the overlap of <clears throat> pseudoparticle densities, maximizing the local pseudoparticle density. And the governing equation in both cases is an eigenvalue equation. Chemical bonding, of course, is predicted by by quantum mechanics. The tropic bonding is predicted by statistical mechanics. So to summarize, we've seen now examples of both enthalpic coming from interaction energy and entropic patchiness. Both of them can be inversely designed for assembly engineering of target crystal structures. So uh, some other takeaways, <clears throat> we have this idea of the entropic bond. This is now a new way to predict crystal structures made of nanoparticles, first with hard particles, but now you could bring the energy back in so we can take into account the entropy of the shape, and the energy of the interactions <clears throat> of whatever is um, coding the surfaces of nanoparticles that we might that we might use. So I'm going to stop there and <clears throat> take a big drink of this coffee. And thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions now. Thank you so <clears throat> much, Sarah. <laughs> and you're getting a lot of clapping. Uh, I will, I think, take over the screen here. And introduce our panel. <laughs> should I should I stop sharing my screen now? Yeah, I think I think it just comes off when I do this. But yeah, that'd be great. Hi. Uh, share. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to talk so much so early in the morning. <laughs> oh, I, I definitely know uh, what you mean. <laughs> and let's see slideshow. I think okay. So oopsie. I'll turn that back on. So let me now introduce our panel. Uh, we have two of the other uh, organizers of ICANX, Professor Martin Tuo, who you know from Iowa State uh, University, and uh, our, uh, our uh, guest, uh, Dr. Nicholas Apepis, who's a world leader in drug delivery, biomaterials, and nanomedicine. He holds the Cockrell Family Regents Chair in Engineering at University of Texas at Austin, 
He's also the director of the Institute of Biomaterials, Drug Delivery, and Regenerative Medicine, and its laboratory of biomaterials, drug delivery, and bio-nanotechnology. He has faculty appointments in chemical engineering and biomedical engineering and the College of Pharmacy. He's a member of the National Academies of Engineering, Inventors, and Medicine, as well as an amazing number of foreign academies, and most recently, the Korean Academy of Science and Technology. He's an editor at Science Advances and also on our advisory board at ACS Nano. And then we have Alice, who, like Cher or Chad or Charo, needs only one name. And <laughs> you all know our, our host, Alice. <laughs> that's great. Uh, everybody out now onto our panel. And I believe that Alice has a couple of questions from the, uh, from the uh, worldwide uh, audience of uh, 300,000 plus uh, people out there who enjoyed that just spectacular <laughs> talk. That was, that, was, that was wonderful. And I, I have some to follow up as well. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, hi, Cheryl. Uh, great talk. Yeah, uh, like artists, I enjoyed the talk very much. Uh, but first, I will try to ask a question from the audience. Yeah, great. The first question come out is from uh, uh, Xinhua, was from Xi'an. Uh, he's uh, quite interesting. In the first part, you share about the nanoparticles assembling. I ask him for how to control the orientation. So the orientation, um, there's a, there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, when the when you have a particle that's coated by you know ligands or or DNA or what have you, and they're attractive to one another, then if they if they uniformly cover the faces and things, then you can imagine the faces will want to align with one another. Now sometimes you can just align the particles and, and figure out what the structure is. That's like analogous to using packing rules, but that often doesn't, doesn't work because it doesn't take into account also um, some entropy in the system. But, but generally you can, design, you can design the orientation either by particle shape where entropy does tend to want to align them or with the interactions. What's interesting about being able to separate the interact the role of interactions from the role of entropy is that typically we think of entropy as working against us in self-assembly. Oh, entropy just wants to make things disordered. But if you have, say, cubes or tetrahedra where uh, they're coated on the faces with attractive ligands, then then entropy wants to align them in a similar way as the as the enthalpy, and so. Mm -hmm. Entropy is working for you. So in some cases we've looked at, for example, the, the amount of energy <clears throat> that you need to align particles might be far less than you thought because entropy is helping you. So but thinking about both of those things can help to align the particles. Okay, that's great. Uh, we have another question it was from Mahal in Beijing. Uh, he said, uh, and maybe one person was from the industry because he said he want to know, you know, for this assembling, how uh, the volume can it go to the, you know, the large volume or the mass production? Hmm. How to oh how to mass how to mass product produce these? Yeah, is that yeah, possible? That, that is a that is a that is a <clears throat> great question. We'd like to turn self assembly into a manufacturing process, right? Um, where you can assemble these things in huge batches uh, in bulk, um, you know, by the bucket mm -hmm. and, and have, you know, the, have, have, you know, really good quality structures um, with high yield. Um, and I think that the, the, what we still need to understand in order to get there is to understand the self-assembly pathways. We now know so much, we the community, about if I, if I have these kinds of particles, I can get these kinds of structures. And we're still discovering more, and a lot of them are non-intuitive and just can't be guessed. Um, but what we know very little about is what is the pathway for self-assembly, right? These pathways, the kinetic pathways of crystallization are you know, critical for making chocolate. It's all the kinetic pathways determine whether you have really fine chocolate 
or not so great chocolate. Um, the kinetics of crystallization are, are critical for pharmaceuticals. Um, and likewise here, we need to understand the kinetics of, of self-assembly and the various pathways. And so we have to engineer not just what building blocks should we make for structures, but, but the whole thing, building blocks and, and the driving forces and, and, the, and the external uh, parameters and protocols for assembling exactly the thing we want every single time. And in fact, if we can do that, we can also assemble, uh, we can now also engineer systems for metastable structures, thermodynamically metastable structures, right? Um, maybe you wanna get those, or maybe you wanna make sure to avoid those. So I think uh, the community is certainly moving in that direction now. There's exciting um, in situ dynamic liquid phase TEM methods now that can be used to actually watch the self-assembly of say, uh, gold nanoparticles in, in, in water. Um, and, and many simulation groups are now starting to look at these kinetics of assembly. And that's what's gonna get us to be able to make these kinds of things really at scale. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Paul, yeah. yeah. Let's go next to our guest, Professor Nicholas Pappas. Sharon, uh, thank you very much. This is an exceptional talk. I've heard you speaking several times recently, but this was so nice <laughs> because it introduces the uninitiated to extremely difficult problems in a very nice way. I felt that your introduction of the patchy particles at the beginning and the possibilities and the connection with the Janus particles and so on brought all of us together into the field. And then you got into this fascinating uh, mathematical models and so on. Some of which, as you said, we understood, some others we didn't. I still try to grab the idea of why you can have uh, only an entrop entropic contribution doing something that you wouldn't have expected it to do it, to do. But I would like to ask, if I may, one or two questions, because I am, of course, naturally affected by my interest in biology. In the calculations, the particles have a shape. They may have an orientation, but they don't have any volume. Am I right? Or can you control the volume of the individual particles? The reason I say that is because I'm thinking of applications in systems where there will be a flexible particle, a particle that is mm. uh, changing. I'm thinking immediately of cells, but on, not, not only cells, subcellular structures and their interactions with one particle or with five particles. Has this been discussed? Has this been a, a done at all? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Nicholas, for the comments and for the, for the question. It's a, it's, it's a great question, um, especially when we think about trying to make these very crude, simplistic patchy particle models for proteins is, uh, or for anything biological is, what about the fact that biological systems are typically not rigid? Um, and so we, we, we actually have been working on this for a while now, developing software that will allow us to now study floppy deformable particles, right? And being able to, to, to vary, you know, what the, what the, you know, how floppy a particle is, how rigid a particle is, and how that contributes to self-assembly. I think that'll be really important <clears throat> for starting to model some different biological systems is in looking at, you know, I imagine these little, you know, flexible, um, what's the word, like blobby kinds mm -hmm. of kinds of arbitrary shapes. Not necessarily, of course, polyhedra. Those are special to nanoparticles. Um, and so that's that's one thing that I think there's just so much to be looked at there. And for us, we're just we're just starting to look at that because it's it's actually kind of complicated code to write to be able to study a hundred thousand or a million interacting blobby objects. So, so that's, so that we're starting to, to look at that, but I'm also really interested in understanding, you know, in, in cells, like things are very crowded, 
right? And so we know that crowding can give rise to interesting anthropic effects. And many of these are, are known and understood, but I don't think that these particular kinds of anthropic effects have been studied inside the crowded environment of a cell. And I, so I think there's a lot of really interesting questions for the field there. And, and the other, thank you very much for this. The other comment I wanted to make is for the younger generation of scientists mm -hmm. that are attending today, and I know there are many. I want to stress something that you said directly as you were going through. The calculations, the computation that is done right now could not have been predicted 15, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it would take us a whole year, as you say, on a cray to come up with one sim simple answer, which we can do right now in a few minutes or in a day. So the field is very mature now to solve truly difficult problems. And what you showed at the very end is really an indication of that. And at the same time, to solve mathematical problems that perhaps we had not considered. Uh, mm -hmm. many years ago. I mean, taking something as simple as the Schrodinger equation and really recasting it in a way to explain what you see. So this is really wonderful. I want to close for the time being with one comment about the Janus particles, because I'm very much interested in actually developing Janus particles that are self-adhesive on one side and mm -hmm. recognitive on the other side. Mm -hmm. And how exactly are they going to distribute in, a, in a, if I have 100,000 of those particles and so on. So I think what you say makes me think that we can expect that in the next few years, we may have some answers to some of these difficult problems. So thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, these, these questions that you're asking now about Janus particles and things, absolutely. Right now we can tell you, if you tell us, this is what my particles look like. Uh, and this is, you know, tell us as much as you know about what materials and what you think the interactions are, then we can make a model and we can study self-assembly make all kinds of predictions for you. Or you can tell us, I want to get a certain kind of arrangement of these Janus particles. I want them to behave in a certain way. Tell me how to, what, what should they look like? Should they be ellipsoidal? Should they be spheres? Should they be, uh, what's the Janus balance? How strong of an attraction? What should be the range of the interactions between the particles? And we can now inversely design that. And that's a new, that's a new thing that, that uh, you know, the field is, is, you know, many, many groups are now working on inverse design. And like you said, it's made possible simply because computers are so fast. Yeah. And it allows us to ask questions and do things that we never would have thought of if we didn't have such fast algorithms and computers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Martin Tuo, one of our organizers. Uh, th thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, very nice to, to, to listen to you this morning. And I can tell you it's fantastic. And then as Nicola said, um, I, I wish I could, uh, I could preach it harder to uh, our younger uh, students and uh, people who are in my rank who are building their career because uh, the, 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 the whole discussion about entropic bond kind of took me back to the work of Ilya Prigogine on chaos. Yeah. And, 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 and then as I watched those uh, crystals, I started thinking, you know, group renormalization, Ken Wilson's work, and, and, uh, and you know, a lot of young people are, are still thinking about classical thermodynamics. And underlying what you share today is a really beautiful picture about thinking beyond equilibrium and out of equilibrium systems. Mm. And as, 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 as I was seeing those come together, I, can, I cannot stop but connect between what the assemblies you're getting and then conversations going on right now about microelectronics that we, if we're gonna get beyond Moore's law, we mm -hmm. have to start thinking beyond the traditional conventional covalent and uh, uh, electronic based bonding and start thinking. And now if I can borrow from you, uh, entropic bonds, how are we gonna use them to get us access to sub nano systems that uh, mm -hmm. then we can build up uh, as uh, somebody asked uh, from, uh, from the audience that we can build up using 
group renormalization theorems and, and, and beyond Schrodinger to, to, to go to, uh, to the, the, to the uh, con uh, sham equations, right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so the, 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 as, I, as I watch all this come together, one of the things that was sticking to me is you have a huge amount of surface area, right? And, and I like surfaces because uh, surfaces are the best manifestation of entropy and chaos and out of equilibrium systems. And I was wondering, uh, you know, have you thought about maybe uh, looking at that and uh, seeing, looking whether there is any correlation between the net surface area, the asymmetries in the surface, which will be tied to the free energy of the system and how that is driving these assemblies. And, and coming back to Nicola's question, if I think about the surface area of uh, 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 an enzyme, for example, and I think about the ligand that is docking in there, I can see how entropic bonds are actually the driving force of uh, that binding event because of the reorganization of the, 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 the water and the fluids along the, mm -hmm. the, the ligand and along the, the binding pocket. And mm -hmm. I can see that these getting manifested in so many ways beyond just building system to come together, but also in, in the biological system. And with that, the surface, even for this uh, squishy or soft matter might, be, might play a very big role because that is an area that is already metastable. You want to find uh, a stable state, but you know, it, maybe this entropic bonding is providing some stabilization of those surfaces and could be playing a bigger role. Have you have you looked into the role of surface asymmetries in the uh, in the in the evolution of the entropic bond? So th that's really you make some really fascinating points, um, Martin, about how to how to think. I mean, for us. You know, just looking at the simple, simple surfaces, I mean, it, it is the surface area, but also the shape mm -hmm. of it that determines how things want, want to align, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, for example, shapes that have fewer prominent surfaces can self-assemble much easier into structures than surfaces with lots and lots of facets or a mixture of different large and small and medium sized facets. Um, in those latter ones, you could have a lot of, um, you know, ambiguity and confusion. And there's lots of polymorphs that, that, are, that are possible. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, I still think there's a, a lot of questions to be asked about, about that and how to, you know, so even if you take spheres, but you do different things to the surfaces, Right from the from a patchiness point of view, whether it's entropic or anthropic, um, then you know you can you can try to understand a lot about the complexity of the of the behavior. But remember that like this is still so basic. So for example, if in enzyme systems and in protein systems, at some point you really want to think about what's the water doing, and we know that the entropy associated with the water and how it organizes or not along the surfaces of these biological molecules is really important. That's a different kind of entropy, but it's an important entropy that can now also be built in. But this other shape entropy part is the part that I think has been ignored uh, that is important once you start to have this, uh, this, even if it's not crowding of many, but you have a, a complex object that's crowding itself, yep. if, that, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, very, very fascinating. And then related to that, do you think curvature will play a very big role in the tropic bonding? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. 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 And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Very interesting work. So, Thank so you. much to do, so much to study. <laughs> I can't uh, wait. I think I'll take the chair's prerogative <laughs> for a final question, uh, which is I'm wondering if you can, you might be able to design a mixture of particles so as to create a gradient crystal where mm. you, uh, you know, where you essentially do a, a chirp separation across the material. You know, you, we know how to set boundary conditions for things like liquid crystals. So presumably, you know, wouldn't be a random starting position, but I wonder if you could uh, uh, be able to, to design 
uh, the, the materials out of which to come up with a chirped, uh, you know, the building blocks to come up with a chirped material after assembly? That is a great question that I take as a challenge to okay. my group to see how to do that. I mean, I could imagine how to do that with many, many nanoparticles of different shapes mm -hmm. or sizes uh, to develop this, this gradient. Um, but I don't know if that's as practical. Like if you wanted to do it out of just certain, certain building blocks, how would you do that? Um, I like it. I don't know the answer, but in principle, yes, we should be able to design that. Now the question is how yes. let's do it. <laughs> well, well, let's thank well, may, may, may Fox I make again for way. such a stimulating talk and discussion. We can see the sun coming up in Ann Arbor, I think. Yes, I know. Um, it's <laughs> you're a few hours ahead of us there. <laughs> may I make one small comment, Paul? Of course. Yes, please, take class. Uh, I, I want to say, Sharon, that on a different matter, but still scholarship, I admire the way you have been directing the chemical engineering department at the University of Michigan the last, how many, five, six years, four years. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, and I remember it again because for those of you who don't know it, her colleague, Nicholas Kotoff, got the uh, David Turnbull uh, a lectureship and medal and award from the Material Society, Research yes, Society, which is a huge award. Uh, Sharon has been able to bring together and also with luminaries like Ron, or like Ron Larson and many, many others, she has been able to bring together really great scientists. So congratulations. I think it takes a vision and at the same time, a strength to be able to pass all these people, especially in a state like Michigan. And I will leave it at that. But you know, to come up with this strong program that you have. Thank you very much for those for those very nice um, comments. Michigan is is a great state. Also, we are the Big Ten national football champions, we yeah, beat Ohio that. State. I'm sorry, Martin, but we beat Ohio State really pretty badly. Is there anyone from Iowa? Because we throttled Iowa in football. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I, Thanks. Thank you. Once again, I think Alice has some announcements uh, coming up for, uh, <laughs> let me move on to the next slide, but thank you once again. That was just, uh, just- Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. Yes, I, I think, yeah. Paul, you can. Oh, yes. Yeah. So normally, of course, we'd be able to walk across the stage and hand you a plaque. And we're looking forward to uh, uh, seeing you perhaps in San Diego at the ACS meeting uh, when we honor some of our other uh, ACS nano editors as well. Uh, and we're looking forward to the world reopening. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have an electronic version of a you know, certificate and plaque for you for this uh, very- so fun, very nice thank you. Stimulating uh, talk, <laughs> thank you. That's great, thanks. And Alice, over to you for the finals yeah. for the scientists. Thank today. you, yeah, actually that's uh, the best part of the, uh, you know, the meetings. We see that to share open a new field. Yeah, no, we welcome many, many young scientists come out, come in. Yeah, we have uh, this Young Scientist Award on IKX. So next uh, Thursday and Friday will be the final defense. So we have, you know, 12 on the Thursday. We have another, you know, nine on the uh, on the Friday. Yeah. So next week will be a big fun to uh, meet all these young scientists and uh, enjoy uh, every Friday. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you yeah. all. Bye. Bye. Share a really nice Bye. talk. Yeah. Thank all you. All the Thanks, artists work. <laughs>